Hello and welcome to Silence, a podcast that gives women a chance to get honest and open about what it's really like surviving and thriving in what often feels like a male-dominated world. All of my guests have been handpicked from the fields of science, technology, engineering and mathematics, or STEM, where inclusivity and diversity can be a real issue. I know this only too well, having been a mechanical engineer myself for a number of years. I'm Dr. Shanice O'Mara, now a television broadcaster. I've worked on and reported on some cutting edge technology and innovation over the years. And through my TV work, I've met some incredibly inspiring women from a diverse range of STEM fields. These women are true trailblazers. And I've often felt so empowered myself by learning what they're like as real people, usually when the TV cameras have been turned off and they're just being themselves. Each week on Silence, one of these women shares her unique experiences and truth without the usual pressure and stress of having to promote her accomplishments or uphold her impressive reputation. How? Because all of my guests are deliberately kept anonymous and disguised to ensure that we as listeners are not distracted or maybe even intimidated by all the usual kinds of societal labels and trophies. The women of STEM on this show have amazingly impressive CVs, but most importantly, they're human just like the rest of us. And I want to share the inspiration and wisdom that I've gathered from them with you. It's my hope that you really relate to what we chat about today. If so, please do subscribe to Silence and maybe even rate and review the show. I'd love to have your feedback. This week, my guest is in the field of healthcare. Hi. Hi, Vashini. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much for having me on your um, show. Ah, it's such a pleasure to have you on. And you sound so sprightly. Um... (laughs) Is that because you enjoy being in healthcare and your day's been very fulfilling? (laughs) Yeah, of course. The day has been very, very fulfilling. I mean, if you're working on something exciting, there's always something to be excited about, something to look forward to. What exactly are you working on these days? I'm working on two things right now, actually. And one of them is um, optimising patient flow through the A&E. Um, and another one I'm work- another project I'm working on, and this is how we met, was um, through we're trying to come up with a non-invasive continuous blood glucose monitoring system for type one diabetics. We've been talking to a few people um, and talking to some machine learning ex- experts, and it's it's very exciting. Yeah, I mean, how did you get into all of this? Like, it's very specific what you do. Is this something that you always knew you wanted to end up doing? No, not at all, actually. Um, I, so this one specifically, so I'm from Sri Lanka. I'm from the northeast part of Sri Lanka. Um, and I go there every summer um, on holiday to see my grandparents. And every time I'm there, I've always seen um, an aging population. So my grandparents live by themselves and I wanted to do something to help the aging population. So I came here and again, on, in hospitals, I've seen um, the, elderly po- the elderly population, so I've always wanted to do something for them. Um, but I didn't really know how that would come down to type 1 di- diabetics. I think that was just through a lot of research, talking to a lot more patients, and then having to narrow down at some point to one disease Gosh, I, I'm <laughs> I'm going to say it on air. Like I, I, my heart just fills with joy that you're Sri Lankan. Because me too. No way. <laughs> oh no yeah. Way. Oh, I had no. <laughs> okay. Half Sri Lankan, half Malaysian, but I really do feel truly Sri Lankan at heart. So, how did it all, how did it all begin for you then? Did, were you born in Sri Lanka? Yeah, I actually was. So I was born there, and I lived there for nine years. So I moved oh, here when wow. I. Was- I was nine um and then yeah so I started studying here um, and that's why I tried to go back as much as I can to yeah keep seeing my grandparents um and what really actually what really struck me when I moved here was the difference in quality of health care and the quality of life is it better or worse here I mean it's, it's I think it's debatable for most people because I think a lot of people I've met who come from Sri Lanka would argue that life is a lot more peaceful back home or, you know, it was a, it would be, it's a lot more um, peaceful in the sense, despite the war, um, in, despite the civil war, I think they would argue that um, in terms of like, in, in terms of being one with nature and just living your life, the country itself is beautiful and it would it's perfect for that sort of lifestyle but I think in terms of um in terms of the principles I believe in like equality equality uh, equal access to healthcare, education 
I, I do feel that the UK is much better in that sense. That's why I always want to go back and do something for healthcare. Healthcare is something I've always felt quite strongly about because I feel like your mental health, your physical health, shouldn't be determined by your wealth or your financial status. Right. Um, and it, it's so important for you to actually, you know, build your life or to do to to go about your daily life. Because what what you're involved in is very sort of like pioneering and. It's very um, innovative and kind of, uh, I mean, it's essentially a startup in Mm -hmm. the medical tech field. Mm -hmm. Um, So why did you choose to go into that arena as opposed to maybe, I don't know, inventing uh, a different type of product? Like why health specifically? I think it it worked out quite naturally because uh, I'm studying medicine um, Mm -hmm. and because of that, I think I'm more exposed to medical problems yeah. Uh, because I, I get to see patients. I get to hear, hear the, hear the world from their uh, sort of viewpoint. Um, so I, I, I think I'm much more aware of problems within healthcare. Um, and also in terms of the resources I have, I think because I'm a medic and because I have friends who are medics and because I have access to professors who can help with, with this sort of area, it just seemed like the natural, um, sort of field to go into Mm, yeah but were you raised in a sort of like medical kind of uh environment were you exposed to medical influences so when I was a kid I not not as far as I remember uh no no neither of my parents are doctors or my grandparents uh one of my aunt is a doctor Mm -hmm. Um, and when I was, when I was, so she was a medical student when I was about three or four years old and she'd try and take me to hospitals. But, um, I, I, I mean, I, I didn't, re- I don't really recall much from that, but what I do re- recall is, um, when I went to, again, back when I went back to Sri Lanka, um, I think a few years ago, um, like I think back in 20, 2016, 2017, actually earlier than that, um, I, I happened to meet a few doctors who worked um, within in Muli Baikal in two thousand and nine? Mm-hmm. So this was during the last stage of the war, and their stories really, really inspired me because these were doctors who were putting their lives at risk to help a hun- like hun- hundreds and thousands of people who are be- who are fleeing into hospitals with no basic facilities, um, with no um, anaesthetics, no no bandages, no painkillers. Um, nothing to carry, not nothing really to carry out their surgeries or their uh, procedures, um, and yet they stood, they they stood their ground. They stayed there to help those people because they have that innate, they have that um, sense of duty. Mm. And yeah. those stories really inspire me. Wow. Um, I don't know because I I think you know if any of them had thought. Uh, if they had put themselves before, I think it would have been they could have left the country before that, mm. or before they had to be in that war war zone. Yeah, but they didn't. They didn't put themselves first. They put their patients first, and I I really look up to that. So, do you want to go back? Uh, I do. I for me, it's not not just Sri Lanka actually, but I think what my dream is to be able to give healthcare access to healthcare to people who've never even had access to healthcare before. Mm. Um, for instance, I went to Myanmar last summer, uh, again on a health uh, on a healthcare project to go and um, educate villages in Myanmar um, on their risk of high blood pressure. Right. Um, and what I what we I found I was actually really shocked by it was that m- many of these villages, in fact, all of none of them had ever seen a doctor before. Wow. Um, and and even as a medical student, they were so in awe of us, so me and a group of uh, a team of medical students. So they were so in awe of us coming there to like check their blood pressure. Uh, they were asking us for advice. They were really, they were truly really trying to get everything out of us because um, they were. I mean, once we left, they wouldn't know who to go to, mm. or they couldn't afford to go and see a doctor. Um, and I think sometimes when we are in the, in the NHS or when we're in the UK, we we can lose perspective. We, I mean, we we try within the NHS we try to 
we have strict uh, strict targets that we like to meet and want to meet and we due to resources due to um lack of funding we're falling short of all of that but at the end of the day we do have we still have one of the best healthcare systems if one of our loved ones falls ill we're not none of us are worried about how much money we'll take to make them survive mm, yeah that's not the first thing that ever crosses our minds and is that why you wanted to study here um no i think i, I because I, I i moved here when i was nine <laughs> again it seemed yeah. natural. but again i actually do believe the uk has one of the best healthcare systems mm. um, despite the criticisms we uh, that we hear about on the news i i feel like the principles the fundamental principles of our healthcare system is very admirable having lived in america for five years mm. i actually think the healthcare system here is pretty great <laughs> um in fact uh, yeah i, I met, uh, yeah a kind of the patients I've seen have said the same as well. Yeah, no, the healthcare system here is, um, I think, you know, it's really good. But the thing is, you don't really see how good a healthcare system is until you're really sick, I don't think. I mean, you know, so, but yeah, no, I mean. And not until you've been sick in another country as well. When we went to Myanmar, one of our friends um, needed to have an operation. Like it was very unexpected. He fell into a ditch and he had a small cut. Um, and he had to have an operation. And this would have been a really small uh, operation. But because of the healthcare system there, this was such a long-winded process. And it took us about 12 hours. And towards the end, they were telling us, you know, the risk of infection is so high that this could lead to an amputation. And, like, there was a risk of amputation. Um, oh, my gosh. And, yeah, it, that, and that was because this was, they left it, you know, this escalated quite quickly because it wasn't being acted on soon enough. Um, but I think it's only when you see healthcare systems in countries like that, that you actually really appreciate the system we have here. Mm, Yeah. Mm. (laughs) So, I mean, you're studying in a very impressive uh, academic institution, which we will not name because we (laughs) want to remain anonymous. Um, but you know, um, the winner of the Channel 4, uh, Britain's Brainiest Child competition Mm. was a Sri Lankan girl. And we do tend to sort of like... We do tend to produce some brainy people in Sri Lanka. Mm. Where do you think that that comes from? Do you think it's nurture from our parents, or we've inherited good brain cells? Like, what do you? Where do you think um, it comes from? I personally believe um, in nurture a lot. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I think I, I believe in. Um, I believe in nurture more than nature. Uh, I do. I mean, obviously, there's inherently there's some parts which we we inherit. But I think um, in terms of being Britain's brainiest child, or in terms of achieving high, uh, being successful, I don't think that's predetermined. Mm-hmm. I think that comes with right. hard and the opportunities you get. Um, and I think in Sri Lanka, especially, um, there is a strong um, culture. There's a strong work ethic in the people I've met. Um, and I think that's because of, so, I mean, I, I, I come from the Northeast of Sri Lanka, um, and back in, back when my parents were growing up, um, getting into university was very, very difficult for them. Uh, so they had, they Mm -hmm. would have, um, only, only the top 11% of the country could go to university, but when they did get to university, university was free, but only the top 11% could actually get into university. Um, and because of the, uh, like, uh, this standardized education system they had, um, each the number of students they could get take from each county was very limited. So in some right. uh, districts, you have to get a higher mark to get into university as opposed to other other others. And they call I think it was called the standardization policy. Or I, I can't I don't really know what what that was. So I think in in my parents, in my um, in my grandparents, and in in like people of their gen- of, of that generation. I've seen them work really, really hard for what they have. Um, and that was yeah. because that that was the system back home. Um, and unlike, say, Britain, I, I, it's very it's very true back home in Sri Lanka that if you don't get into university, if you don't do if you, if you don't do a science, maths or an engineering degree, it's very hard for you to get a job otherwise. Um, mm. That's what I've seen. Um, so so I think that's where I think that's where the work ethic comes from for all these kids yeah I mean what what have your parents been like in terms of sort of like encouraging you or supporting you or maybe even pushing you to go into the studies you're in 
Hmm. I think um, I think I've been very lucky in that sense. Um, my parents are very open minded and they're very um, they I think they they've encouraged me to lead a balanced life in every way. In fact, when so in Sri Lanka, when I was growing up in one year two, um, they they would do this thing where they rank you, um, and everyone knows your rank in your whole year. Oh um, and I remember, yeah, and I remember in year one and year two, I remember coming last in my year. But that was because I didn't know my I didn't know the language. So I'd go to the exam and I couldn't even read the questions. So I ended up coming last for two years till I learned to pick up the language. Um, but during those times, my parents didn't tell me, you know, oh, you can't do this or, you know, they didn't try and push me. They, in, I think during those years, they instead, they made every effort for me to um, interact with other kids, to learn, to pick up the language. They didn't, they didn't sort of, push me the sense of putting me into tuition they didn't do anything like that they let me take it in my own pace um right and I, so I, there's I, no real pressure then yeah there was no real pressure at all and so when I came to when I came here to, to the UK um in yeah I came here in, uh, in year four and I had two years and so all my f- parents friends were telling them about this this exam called the 11 plus exam you may have heard of it um so the 11 plus exams is to get into a grammar school um, and there was a lot of pressure but from, say, like my parents' friends, my extended family, for me to do well in this exam. But my parents were really mm. understanding in that sense. They took me to different schools in my in my neighbourhood and they said, OK, this is a normal school. This is a grammar school. Um, they took me to, to the open days and they said, if you do this exam, you can go to a grammar school. But at the end of the day, it doesn't make a huge difference if you work hard. Um, it's up to you whether you want to go to this school or that school. And if you do want to go to this school, then we'll help you. So again, they didn't really push me in that sense. So it was really the it was really up to you. It was your choice, yeah. like where you yeah. felt and comfortable. I'm, exactly, and I'm so grateful to my parents for giving me that opportunity to try different mm. things, to actually experiment with a few, you know, lots of different things. Um, mm. yeah. So, what were you like as a kid then? Like, were you very sort of like? Uh, in charge of your own decisions did you feel very confident to to choose what was right for you um I think I've always been a bit of a rebel um so if someone tells me you can't I can't do something that's the first thing I do um Hmm. and I've been really adventurous I'd like to put I, I I've always wanted to push myself out of my comfort zone if there was anything that I couldn't do or if anyway if there's anything that people said I couldn't do then that's um, as in the sense, in the in the sense, that I'd always wanted to do something people said I couldn't do or I can't do. I uh, I've been like that. <laughs> really? Um, yeah, but does do you not think that having that kind of attitude means that you end up doing things that you didn't really want to do, but you were kind of just trying to prove yourself? Um, I think that has happened in in the past, yes. But I think now I, I think I'm a bit more mature now, and I've learned from those mistakes. So now I've I've just got that self confidence and. I, I just end up doing what I want to do, regardless of what people tell me. I, right. I don't feel like... And what yeah. is driving you? What is driving me? Um, I, I feel like I feel like there, there should be a bigger purpose to, to my life than, um, than... Like, I don't see myself going, going to a job nine to five, coming back home, having dinner, watching TV, and repeating the same thing again for 40 years of my life. I want to know that whatever I do has a bigger impact um, on a larger number of people. And I want to be able to see that impact. Um, and I think that's that's what really drives me. Um, more so than, say, going into hospitals, talking to patients on a, a one-to-one basis. I want to be able to work mm-hmm. on something, do something, which would have a long-lasting impact, uh, a positive impact on many more people. Um, right yeah yeah I, yeah I think that's how I would that's that's what I like to think about yeah and has it been a journey to get to know what's driving you or from a very young age do you always know no no not at all uh, I think it, this has been a journey um it, I've always I, I mean even since I was a kid I've I, I think everyone goes through this sort of um this sort of crisis where they try to find what they're looking for, what they want to do in life. And I've had that as well. Um, 
I think initially, you know, I thought, okay, maybe it was money I was after. But as soon as I realised that's not going to make me happy. Um, and then I, I really like dancing. So I thought, okay, maybe I can, you know, just, just be dancing every day. But again, that I tried that over my gap year. I, I wasn't feeling happy. But actually, I think what really does motivate me, and I've come to that realisation now, it might change in the future, but right now I think what I want to be working on is working on something which which will have an impact on a hundred small people. Right. Yeah. So it sounds like you went through a bit of a process of experimenting and trying to figure yourself out. And then, mm-hmm. you know, now you've found, now you've kind of landed. Yeah. I wouldn't say landed because, um, again, I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to restrict myself in that sense. Um mm. Well, I'm sure I'd, I'm, there's still more I'd find out about myself in the future and there's still more I'd learn. Um, but yeah, that's where I'm at right now. Right. Hmm. It's so interesting to hear your approach to it because it, you kind of sound very sort of like forgiving of yourself and, um, you know, very sort of like uh, compassionate towards your ambitions where it's like, yeah, it might change, but for now, like this is what I want to hmm. do. This is not the kind of Sri Lankan attitude I'm used to. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, I, I would I, I give a uh, hundred percent credit to my parents for sort of. I think I I honestly owe a lot to them for not pressurizing me into doing something I don't want to do, mm. um, and for giving me that liberty and that freedom. And I actually remember my dad when he dropped me off at university on the first day. Um, in my car, in the car on the drive to uni, university on the first day, he was telling me, you know, you could go into university every day so on the front row, take good le- notes in your lectures, um, go back home, study, and you will come up with a first class degree. But university is a lot more than that. There, there are so many more opportunities you want to do. And he was saying, you know, I'd much rather you came out with a degree. It doesn't have to be first class. You don't have to pass top in the year. But as long as you come out having had experiences, which is made you more informed which has made you a better person then he was saying that in his view that would be a better use of my time um and I think and what did you feel about that I was I mean this is first year of university and and this is my my first day I was really happy that my dad was taking it so chill so um I was I was I was all ready to go and start experimenting um everything from sports to dance to um, other societies and that's how I ended up um, get you know getting involved with entrepreneurship um, I didn't really know that, that was mm. me but again that was through a trial and error process yeah so it sounds like you've really given yourself the freedom to explore all aspects of your personality mm. um, and not sort of um, sort of beating yourself up for f- running into dead ends <laughs> yeah yeah I think um, I mean, yeah, but I, I think I, I also understand that now is, I mean, yeah, I, there, obviously if I'm going to try everything, I'm, there will, there will be, there will be dead ends and it's just an understanding that I have. Mm. I'll try something. It's not going to work out, but that's fine. I can go on and try something else or keep trying at that thing. If that's something I really want to do. Uh, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Gosh, that's such a great attitude. <laughs> So um, what's it been like studying? Like, do STEM subjects come really naturally to you or have you had to work hard? To no, I, I've, um, I think ever since I was a kid, I've always been a very STEM girl um, in a sense. I've, I've, I love I've loved maths. I love science. Um, and I love how sort of current science and maths are, um, how I can relate it to things I read on the news um, and how science and maths really does change the future um so I've always I've always been into maths and science and they have come I I find them a lot more logical so for me I find it easier to grasp and I've been like that since I was a child Mm. do you have siblings yeah I do I have a younger brother and a sister and are they um stem biased no no my brother is very uh artsy he likes to draw he wants to go into graphic design um he's and he's very creative in that sense um he he's not very he's not very into science or maths um and then and then I've got my sister who wants to I think right now she's quite young so I think right now she wants to go into law but that 
for another week, so I don't know what she wants to do next week. <laughs> so you really have found STEM just out of pure curiosity and attraction to it? Yeah, I, I would say so, yeah. Um, and I think it also helps that my um, my both my parents have, are, have done um are into stem so my mom came the reason i came to the uk was because my mom came here to do her phd in uh plant oh, pathology okay. uh, and so that was stem so uh during my holidays i'd go with her to you know, her university and um watch her put her, her cultures mm. under the microscope um and she'd pull me in and be like oh have a look at the microscope um so i've had that sort of exposure um I think since then, I I just knew I I didn't want to be looking at <laughs> microscopes since I had mm. That's not what I wanted to do. But I, I yeah, the way she spoke about it, I've, I've always yeah. found that quite and interesting. Yeah, and you've obviously sort of inherited that sort mm. of STEM slant. How about your dad? Then? Mm. Is he in STEM? Yeah. Yeah, my dad, my dad um, studied agriculture um, right. in back home in Sri Lanka. Um, so... It's yeah. It, again, it's very. It's it, yeah. He's very into um, outdoors. Um, he's mm. he's into uh, field work. He likes being out and about in the fields. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, STEM is such a. It's it really STEM subjects really require you to sort of um, analyze and look for patterns and uh, trends and you know, pay attention to detail and think about things methodically and logically. So I can understand sort of like growing up with the parents you've got, like it probably just through osmosis kind of felt it into you. Are you the eldest? I am the eldest, yes. I can understand why being the eldest and, you know, you're you're very driven and um, I just, I love this attitude of kind of experimentation. Um I mean, what goals do you have in the future? Do you tend to plan and make a mental note of your ambitions and things? Yeah. So I think I start. So uh, again, my views on setting plans and goals like this has changed throughout the years as well. So I think when I was, I, when I first, I made like a 10 year plan when I was 14 or something. And I said, okay, for in year 10, I'm going to do this. In year 11, I'm going to do this. In year 12, this, this, this. I had a list of things I wanted to accomplish each year. But then I came to university and then I thought, you know, like, what do these lists mean? Like, what does it mean if I've ticked, it, ticked this off? Um, and do I want to live my life according to this, like, this checklist that I've, I made for myself five years ago? Um, and I think my views on that has changed. Um, I think I truly now believe in experiment experimenting being adventurous and making choices every day um so not making choices depending on what i wanted to do five years ago um, but making choices every day and being open to new changes being open to new opportunities um so i do have some sort of an idea of where i want to be in 10 years time now but i would i don't think i i planned it in as much detail as i did 10 years ago mm. Mm. so what are your uh, sort of like short-term goals then because you have what you're studying medicine um how does it work like when are you done um how far through are you that kind of thing okay i have so i'm doing my integrated bsc this year um and after this i will have two years before i become a doctor so that that's what that's on that's first on my priority to finish my degree Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, I really want to work on this startup properly, um, get our prototype, get our get our product to customers and patients through the NHS. So that's second on up on my priority. Um, and everything else will be what else comes my way. Yeah, it's so <laughs> it's so interesting to like imagine you not only doing your degree but like you know pushing this. Um, this tool that you've developed as well as kind of experimenting with like dance and things like that, like really contrasting things. Like yeah. how are you able to balance all of that and stay sane? I mean, since I was in, since I was a kid, I've always had multiple things going on at the same time. So mm-hmm. I think I would actually go insane if I didn't have anything much to do or if I only had one or two things right. to focus on. And I, mm-hmm. I feel like I seek out multiple things to do 
um, to, to keep myself more productive and to keep me constantly thinking about something. Right. Yeah. So it's always needing to stimulate your mind and be busy and things like that. Yeah, hundred percent. So what's it like being uh, a medical student and female? Like, are you aware of any sort of like gender differences or? Um, actually with medicine, I think in, so in my cohort, cohort, um, the ratio is just over 50, 50, 50 for girls. Hmm. So, yeah, so that's actually really good. So, um, in, in that sense, I haven't, I haven't seen, um, I haven't seen any more, I don't know, I haven't, I haven't felt like I was at a disadvantage. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think it works the other way with medicine sometimes because um, so sometimes when we're, when we're practicing for our practical exams, we get marks on showing empathy. We get marks on um, knowing how to speak to patients. So when we practice this with friends, jokingly, people could, you know, we would they would as a joke or as a remark, they would say something like, oh, it's easy for you girls because empathy comes naturally for you or that emotional intelligence comes naturally for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think so in that in that sense, I sometimes see it working in reverse because um, I don't think that's necessarily the case. And I feel, you know, I feel like um, regardless of whether or not you're male or female, um, emotional intelligence, um, being able to understand people, and being able to show empathy should be a thing for both both sexes. Yeah, so, I mean, definitely should be, but. Do you not think that women do have a nan- natural tendency towards empathy versus the guys? Because, I mean, I think we live in a society where men feel they have to be, um, they have to display bravado and actually they probably suppress their ability to be empathetic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that that's exactly what it is. I think it's not that they don't feel empathy. It's not that they don't empathize. It's actually, it's more that society has trained them to suppress those emotions. So then they put mm. on this facade. Um, and there's really no need for that. Um, yeah. But, that, but that's, that is what I see in medicine sometimes. Um, and so that's I, kind of like societal pressure clashing with um medical studies um in the sense that a bit of empathy would go probably very far in medicine whether you're male or female right I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah yeah um yeah. yes i do I, I do believe that i think it is it is very much society society's perceptions and then you're feeling the need to keep up with that but then it also i i do notice that in a few years into medical school um that becomes secondary because then you start putting your patients first. So I I feel like by the time they graduate, that difference isn't so obvious. Right. But this is something I picked up on in, say, first year. It's interesting because a few weeks ago, I had uh, a guest on the show that studied medicine and she thought mm. that it was really sexist. Oh, really? Um, yeah, and she had some really horrific stories to tell about sort of like sexism in the in the dissection room sort of thing and it was just uh it was really shocking and I just I I didn't realize I I I wasn't expecting those kinds of stories um Mm -hmm. in the medical field because you kind of feel like anyone that studies medicine really cares about human beings yeah so it's refreshing to hear your completely different take on things no I I honestly I I don't feel I don't think I've seen that side in medicine mm. um where i've but but then i also the thing is i also come into contact with um non-medics people who do engineering and i think the difference in those departments is a lot more um it's a lot more obvious yeah and it's kind of making me wonder whether it's something to do with you <laughs> because <laughs> you know sometimes i think we attract um yeah. What we certain put treatment out. yeah mm-hmm. what's your view on that i know i i i completely i completely agree i i really believe in this um law of attraction uh whatever you think whatever you put out there whatever you want kind of comes to you um mm. 
and I think growing up, I've never, I've never, I went to an all girls school and in my family as well. I, I never thought before coming to university that being a female would put me at a disadvantage. Mm. I, I that, that thought was never in my mind. Um, so when I did come into university, I didn't really expect to be treated any less, or I didn't expect to um, have to face any sexist comments. Right. So, and what's been the uh, reality? So I, I haven't really picked up on that. But even then, I, I even regardless of that, I've I only really opened up to this sort of the difference in how the the obvious discrimination um, between between males and females. I only really picked up on that at university. Um, and again, like I said, I haven't really picked up on it within within medicine, but I have picked up on this within um, non medics. So, what's the re- what's the reality been like now? Um, you weren't expecting to, you know, be differentiated because of your gender, but what's the reality been? Um, the reality has been actually quite different. Um, so. So, for instance, I was actually I was the pre- I was president of a society last year, and the majority of um, c- the committee members were male, and this is all fine. But I did then feel uh, last year I did feel at some point I was struggling to find the find the balance between um, being heard and being approachable. So, um, for instance, I felt like if if I was being, if I was being quite approachable, if I was being nice, um, mm. it was hard to get my voice heard. It was hard to. If you were being people. nice, if, if I was being nice, I think nice is a very vague word. But word, but I'm saying, yeah. If I was, but if you were being, I, yeah, I was saying, I was saying, if I'm trying, if I, if I, as president, if I was trying to make an effort to listen to every everything everyone had to say, mm-hmm. uh, which I always wanted to do, which I, I believe in, I, uh, that's that was something I, I gave importance to. Um, it was, it was, it would, it was very easy for say another a, a male member or someone else to just be like, oh no, this isn't this isn't a great idea. Let's just do this, and then right for someone was, to sort of try and dominate. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and 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 then I and at times like that, I felt like I needed to be louder or I needed to be more forceful. Yeah, with what I had, um, and. And actually, there have there have been a, a few other sort of uh, female um, committee members who have said the same to me. They'd come and they'd sometimes come and talk to me alone about their opinions on a few few issues um, instead of speaking out in committee meetings because they, because they don't feel like they're being heard. And at times like that, I actually really do think about this because as as another female, uh, as another female chairing this meeting, if these guys can't be heard, if they feel like they can't be heard in a in a meeting with a few more with amongst their male peers um mm. i you know I, I that that gets me worried yeah so it's kind of like trying to strike this balance between making the men feel valid but also standing mm. up for yourself exactly yeah yeah it's so tricky isn't it because you know often assertive women get um put down um and given the label oh you're so aggressive and you know you're we're 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 kind of broken down through trying to stand up for ourselves Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. and and at the same time sometimes I feel like it's more about sort of pacifying the audience if they're all male and sort of like just trying to make them feel like they count and it's Mm -hmm. kind of like the women's role is to not only assert herself but to also make her audience feel valid you know it's difficult when you when your own self-belief is not like the strongest you know because you're kind of not really familiar in your role or anything like that so yeah I I resonate with everything you've just said yeah um and I think in 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 that in in those situations I think as a female you have to go above and beyond to to strike I don't think as a male they'd even think about this. Um, I don't think like any of my male friends are thinking, "Oh, am I going to, you know, if I if I listen to this person, does that does that mean I risk not being heard myself?" I don't think any of them are having that sort of internal conflict. Yeah, I mean, as a result of being exposed to that um, kind of dynamic, have you? Would you say that you've um, changed? 
um, in personality or evolved or adapted? I yes, I do. I do think so. And in fact, the, uh, my, I think my committee members even said that to me. They they felt like I was a different person. I, it was by the end of the year, I, I was a different person chairing these meetings. And I think that's because over the year, I would become a lot more assertive. Um, and I was I was confident to if someone did speak out of turn or if someone did sort of um, put so, another member of the team team down because you know or if, if I felt like someone was um, speaking over another female member, I'd be the first to say that's not on. Let let, let them speak. Um, and I, I think that's because I've I've been at the receiving end, and it's yeah. just important for them to know. That. And I think it's important for. Um, the females on the team to know that their voice is being heard as well. I mean, I must say, listening to you, I get the impression that you you come across as being very approachable and very kind and, you know, you're driven by yeah. the need to help others. I mean, that's all very yeah. clear. So it sounds, I'm inspired by the fact that you <laughs> are um, able to strike a balance between standing up for yourself and being forthright in your ideas and confident yet not sort of like trampling all over everyone you know yeah I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say I've uh, managed to strike the perfect balance yet and I think that's still a very ongoing learning process for me mm. um but it, it is something that I've picked up on and it's something I, I'm still needing to do a lot more work on to get that balance right um, yeah I mean as you as you progress in you know, what is probably a male dominated uh, environment, industry, um, ultimately, like, how do you see yourself um, balancing all other aspects of being a woman, like maybe motherhood, family, relationships, like, are you interested in having those things? Or is it just about career? No, I think I don't think um, either of those are mutually exclusive. I think you can, um, with planning and with an understanding partner. I think it, it's very possible to have both um, without compromising on either. Um, but actually, you know, um, on that note, I I have so I so at my university we get assigned a personal tutor who uh, who um, take, who advises you on potential careers. And um, I remember going up to him, you know, um, I think a few years, like last year, last year, and telling him, I think I want to become an emergency consultant. Um, and he told me, oh, that's that's a very good career. That's very good. It's all of that. But, you know, it, it is a very demanding field. And he told me, you, know, you need to think if you if you wanted to become, um, you know, if you want to have a family of your own in a few years down the line, you may not be able to to do both too well um and again like i said going back to my inner nature if someone tells me i can't do something that's something i want to do right. so but it's it's i think it's again it's worrying that someone um who is there to guide us on careers yeah even it's kind I mean, of I mean, yeah this he this was a he, this was a very it was discouraging, but he, it was very subtle, though. It wasn't obvious. He didn't say, "Oh, don't do emergency medicine." He said, "Yeah, you can do this. This is what you need to do it." But just think about think about the fact that in a few years you might have you might have children, you might have a family, you might not be able to do both. And he said, "Have you considered a career in radiology, where you have more flexible <laughs> work hours?" Um, and I was I was a bit disappointed with with that particular meeting because I wasn't expecting that at all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's tricky, isn't it? Because you, I don't know, maybe someone that is in, is at the stage of life I'm in, um, mm. it maybe would have been great advice. Uh, but at the same time, when you're, you know, early in your career, you, the sky's the limit for you. You want to prove everyone wrong and you want to yeah. break stereotypes. Exactly, yeah. Um, so what is the plan then? Like, are you going to pursue uh, something that, you know, that mm. has been, where you've been advised that it isn't something you can juggle with? No, I, I mean, I, I don't think I'm going to let that hold me back. Um, I, I 
I do think I can have, I can have, I've always, I mean, I don't feel the need to sort of compromise just yet, but I think that um, maybe that's because of my sort of, that's me being naive um, about what, the other stuff that could come in the future. But I actually still believe that if I do have a family, if I do, if I do get into a relationship, it should be a very much 50, 50 thing. Um, mm. I should be able to have the career I want and be able to give um, my family or my, my personal life enough commitment as well. Um, but again, like I said, we'll just see how it goes. But uh, right now I'm not, I'm not thinking of compromising on my career at all. Right. And in terms of like kids, it sounds like you do want a family one day. Like yeah. at this stage in your career, like, do you think um, that you'd want to have kids later or sooner? Like uh, how, what is your thinking at this stage? I, um, I haven't actually thought about this. Um, no, I, honestly, I haven't. I, I haven't thought thought about this, but I think mm. before I have kids, I want to be. Um, I want to be um, settled in in myself, and I right. feel like right now I still I, I still have a lot of this sort of adventurous side of me where I want to try different things. I, I'd be very happy to move to a different country sort of every two weeks, every three weeks. I'd be more than happy to do that. Um, mm. And I think once I once I've sort of settled down in that sense uh, I don't mean I don't mean um actually I really don't like the word settling down I don't want to say settling down but once I've <laughs> uh, um I think once I'm more um secure in my career yeah yeah I think that's that's probably when I consider having kids but actually yeah. I don't want to have kids of my own I actually want to adopt kids oh wow that's interesting that's what I want to do. So I, I is that why? Why do you have that view? I, I think so. I I feel like um, so. My thinking is, why bring my own kids into this world when I can? When there are kids in this world who don't have the resources that they need, um, there's so much talent out there. These kids could have a better life. So r- rather than me having my own kids, why can't I bring up these other kids? as my own kids wow um, that's beautiful. and, I, and I, I don't feel like that way I'm at a loss I'm losing anything um because mm. I feel like once I've adopted them they would be my kids um and I would give them everything I would give my actual kids so I don't feel like um that's setting me back in any way uh, I don't feel like that's going to take anything from the relationship I'd have with them mm. um and I feel like you know rather than bringing two new kids if I can help to existing kids um that that would make me happier that's so interesting because how how do your sri lankan parents feel about that kind of view do they know uh honestly i haven't, I haven't spoken to them about this but um actually in my extended family there have been several people who have adopted kids oh, um, really? oh. amongst my extended family yeah and and I don't feel like that's changed anything about them. Uh, so, and I, I've all, I've looked up to them uh, for inspiration. So I, I don't feel like that's changed their bond or anything, anything like that. Mm. So, yeah, that's something I would I would like to do. Uh, that's so fascinating to me because um, my own family, like you know, yeah. we have uh, my my parents have a little grandson, um, despite mm. having three daughters. And um, he is absolutely worshipped. Um, and I think, you know, if my parents could choose, they would love to have way more grandchildren. But, you know, mm-hmm. I think it can be really tricky when you're um, in high level academia because you work so hard to get there and it's so mm-hmm. rewarding and so challenging at the same time that you kind of don't want to waste it. Um, yeah. And so it's difficult to know exactly when to fit in motherhood. Mm. Yeah. Is that something that you have foreseen or that, you know, has crossed your radar or do you think you're still too young to mm. worry about it? Uh, so I haven't actually, like, I haven't given it extensive thought. All I, like I said, all I know is that I would want to adopt two kids at yeah. some point. Um, and when I do, I would want to give them a lot of my time, uh, at, at least during the early years um but 
maybe I don't know. I, I honestly can't say. I I I don't know when that would be. It's it's kind of great because then you don't have any of the biological clock pressure. Mm-hmm. That exactly. Yeah. Have. To my advantage. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Wow. That does sound like a really good solution. And it sounds so, again, so sort of like selfless and loving to actually um, want to have that rather than uh, your own sort of biological children, which I think a lot of people are driven by that biological need because it's actually quite um, a self-centered ambition. If I could yeah. be so brave as to say that without causing too yeah. much upset, but yeah, no, it's it 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 does it sounds in line with what's driving your career as well, which is to help people, which is really yeah. beautiful. Oh, um, well, you mentioned you. you mentioned earlier that um, you know you were talking to your personal tutor, and mm. you know you were slightly discouraged. But do you have the opportunity to sort of? like talk to other women about like your ambitions and you know just confide in other women yeah um in fact like I think I'm really lucky to be surrounded by my close friends who are who are equally ambitious Mm -hmm. um in everything that they want to do in everything they want to achieve and I don't think any of us have ever thought of compromising our careers um or thought of um I mean, yeah, I mean, when I speak to them, I always feel more more inspired to focus on my career, to go get what I want, to make make a difference. Um, So, yeah, yeah, I do do have a chance to sort of confide in them and talk to them. Um, Yeah, I always find them very motivating. And so as a woman in STEM medicine Mm -hmm. um what advice would you give to any sort of like young prospective uh stemmers prospective stemmers i think they should just go for it um there is there is absolutely there's nothing stopping them from going into stem stem is such an exciting and upcoming field um and you shouldn't feel like there's a barrier or that you shouldn't feel like you won't be good enough or that you you know there's something stopping you from getting into stem um like girls, boys, everyone alike has the same sort of skill sets if you work hard. So if you're working mm. hard, something you're passionate about, there is there is absolutely no way why you shouldn't go. There's no reason why you shouldn't go into STEM. Um, and I think STEM is very, it, it, it would reward you very highly in terms of um, satisfaction. But, you know, so, as, a, as a student that where STEM subjects came naturally, um, mm. I guess you would sort of advise that but what if um you're interested in stem fields but not necessarily great at the subjects okay so i think if you're interested that's that's a good start because if you're interested then you can always get good at the subjects i feel um but i think the important bit is to seek out extra help um Mm. to go out of your way um maybe whether that's finding teachers finding people in the older years um going going online to get some extra help reading up on what's coming up what's um you know what's already out there um to get to gain some knowledge on the subject Mm. and once you've decided for sure that stem is what you want to go into then i think what it comes down to is just hard work and putting in the hours Um, and you know you know when you were talking about sort of experimenting with different things and mm. you know sometimes you've reached Mm. a couple of dead ends like Mm. um what was it that made you think, ah, oh, this isn't for me? Like, did you just not enjoy it? Or, you know, what, what was telling you that this was a dead end? It's, I think it's just, um, it, it could be, it, sometimes it's fun. Like, whatever activity was I was doing, it would, would be fun whilst I was doing it. But, I'd, I mean, sometimes you come back home and you think, okay, you know, but what, what am I doing with my life? You know, what, what, what's my bigger purpose here? Um, mm. How am I contributing? to the world or to the extended sort of society um and that's always been a question i've had at the back of my in the back of my mind right. um 
And I think that comes back to this really like a specific sort of tradition my mom has instilled in me when I was a kid. So on and each of my birthdays, um, instead of ta- instead of you know having a party or, or whatever, she would take me to uh, an orphanage on my birthdays. Um, and on that on that day uh, on my birthday, she'd tell me in the morning, you know, um, your birthday is your chance to remember why you're here. Um, this is you've had another year on this world in this world. Um, if this is another day to remember why you're here and how you can what you and to sort of reaffirm to yourself what you can give back to society how you can contribute to the people around you and as part of that she would um when I was about four or five six I'd go play with um the children at a local orphanage um and it was her way of saying you know there are people like this what what can you do to help them uh, and that was something she'd made a point to instill in me since I was a child Wow. Um, and I think I think that's always something that I have at the back of my head, you know, like what you know. Mm. Um, fair enough, I could be going out, I could be having fun, but I always come back home, or you know, and I always think, okay, but oh, you know, what's my purpose in life? How am I making um, use of myself? How am I making use of my skills, making use of my knowledge to make an impact on many more people? Um, and it's it's so the other stuff I've tried I've had a lot of fun doing them I found I found them fulfilling in the sense that I enjoyed it but I didn't I wasn't satisfied with with how it fitted in with my overall purpose Mm. wow well that is an absolutely amazing note to end on thank you so much (laughs) for sharing your experiences and your wisdom with us today like I I just I I I can feel your greater purpose um just from speaking to you for an hour um and you know even though I don't have a clear sense of what your overall purpose is because that's probably a very private thing like Mm. it your personality exudes something so much bigger than just studying stem like it it, you're you're on to big things that's for sure. Oh, I can feel it. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast today. I've, I've really enjoyed speaking to you today. That's it from my STEM guest this week. Gosh, what a sweet girl. And I'm not just saying that because she's Sri Lankan, even though I am slightly biased. Um, God, I really feel like we've heard from someone today who just has no ego and just really wants to help other people. And through her intelligence, and her entrepreneurship, she's going to be making an impact in this world that, you know, just will help so many people through the medical field. As always, I'm so inspired, but I also feel like I need to go away and sort of review my own greater purpose. And that's what my guest has done for me today. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to rate and review the show and catch you next week on Silence.